Father, we are grateful to you, Lord, for keeping us safe and sound. There is trauma, fear, and death all around us. Lord, it's your faithfulness alone, Lord, it's your grace alone that we could be safe and sound today. And thank you also giving us another opportunity that we brethren could come together in unity and love to admonish, to uh, educate one another, to equip one another, oh Lord. The hour we are going to spend in your presence, meditating your word and studying your word. Lord, maybe a time of encouragement and edification for us, Lord. Strengthen us as pastor is teaching, Lord, I pray that we may be able to hear your voice and may be able to perceive the message that you want to impart in our hearts. The words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today I'm going to uh, sort of uh, deal with this particular subject which we had discussed last time, and that is about uh, the environment. Uh, it is. It was part of our uh, uh, the question and answer in the booklet, but I felt that it it needed perhaps uh, some some extended treatment. So uh, I'm going to basically give you a PowerPoint presentation on uh, the subject of environment, and then uh, read you the what the booklet mentions. And after, of course, we will get into discussion. So what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and straight away share my screen with you. And uh, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Well, as you notice, the title to my study today is A Christian Response to the Environmental Crisis. Uh, the Awareness of the environment, uh, I think, sort of uh, came only after we started recognizing the, the crisis that it is going through, isn't it? We never really thought much about the environment and particularly its care. Uh, all of this began to emerge when people, uh, scientists started pointing to the fact that uh, the unusual weather conditions or patterns that we were experiencing probably had something to do with the way we treat the environment. And so today we are talking about an environmental crisis. Uh, the um, fact that the environment is being affected by the way human beings are living their lives here on this earth. That is, seems to be what uh, the scientists seem to be saying. Now, the question is, is it real? Is there really an environmental crisis? And of course, we have many who say no. <laughs> uh, there are those who believe that you can just keep living the same, doing the same things, uh, you know, going through all those so-called growth that we talk about. Um, when, they are told, when they are told about the weather patterns changing, well, they say it's basically normal. You know, it's cyclical, they say. And uh, you know, just like you had an ice age at one point in time, uh, and then everything became normal, well, I guess they believe that... Um, the, what we see and the patterns we notice in the environment is basically the same. But on the other hand, there is there are also another group of people who say the crisis is real. They believe that too much of carbon dioxide is being emitted through the burning of fossil fuels, and that is being trapped in the environment, leading to global warming. And uh, the proof of that is in the melting of the ice caps and the extreme weather patterns that we are noticing. And so this, these, this group of people believe that we are committing environmental genocide. That's how they put it, all right? Now, I don't know where you stand, 
with this? Uh, do you believe there is an environmental crisis? Uh, the, 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 the study today is not necessarily a scientific analysis whether there is a crisis or not. Uh, the study today will focus more on, you could say, a theology in um, creation care. You know, you can, uh, that's the term that we use uh, within our biblical perspective. Does the Bible have anything to say about the environment? Now, if you ask my personal view with regards to the crisis, I would lean more towards the scientists who believe there is a crisis. Um, so uh, um, I believe that the way man is living is probably affecting the environment. I would lean more towards that. But whether real or not, the question for us today is, is caring for the environment necessary? Perhaps you could say, is it mandated? Uh, is creation care uh, a biblical uh, you know, perspective? What is the biblical perspective on that? So that is what we will discuss today. Uh, so let me go ahead and then look at the pros and cons. Uh, okay, and uh, if you notice on your screen, you will see, is creation care biblical? Like I said earlier, some people say, no, it is not, uh, you know, we really don't have to wonder or, or think about creation care. Uh, they have some reasons for that. And let me just uh, give you some of the reasons. One is that they believe that uh, looking after the creation or, or giving care to the creation is almost like worshiping the creation. All right. They believe that uh, we don't have to worship nature. Uh, that is almost like idolatry, right? Uh, and so their argument is if you give too much of importance to the creation and uh, begin to sort of uh, provide extensive care to it, it's almost like worshiping the creation. I would like to just offer a, a, a counterpoint there, and that is. Just caring for the creation is not necessarily worshiping the creation, right? For example, I'm sure you care for your car or you care for your house. I wouldn't want to believe that you are worshiping your car, even though some look after it in such a manner where they, it seems like they are worshiping the car, right? But basically looking after your car is not necessarily worshiping it. Now, some, uh, uh, some people, if I can just mention this, have a pantheistic approach. You know, the, the, the whole concept of pantheism is that God is the creation, right? Everything is God, right? I think that is also the uh, view of uh, some philosophical thoughts, believing that uh, anything and everything is God. Nothing else ex exists except accept God. So if that is the view, and then you look after the creation from that perspective, down, that may, you know, uh, pose a question. Uh, it may be anti-biblical. I don't know if you know, heard about the Franciscans. You know, the Franciscans are an order among the Catholics. And uh, the, the Franciscans have a very interesting view about, about creation and about nature. And they, I don't think they they say, uh, or rather believe in the pantheistic view, but they do value and respect nature, you know, very, very uh, dearly. For example, uh, the Franciscans believe that all animals are, are brothers and sisters. <laughs> now, so they will, uh, they will call a giraffe as brother giraffe or... Uh, you know, or sister giraffe. <laughs> so I'm not sure where that view stands, but nevertheless, worshiping the creation is not necessarily, uh, you know, in my view, worshiping it. Here is a second thought. Some, uh, those who believe in, uh, you know, the say no to creation care, believe that 
the earth is going to be burned up in a fire and that's what the scriptures tend to indicate so if that is the case why bother about looking after the creation now why do they say that uh, the earth is going to be burned up uh, let me just see let me just go to second peter chapter 3 and uh, let me read you that verse as it is quoted there second peter 3 verse 10 says but the day of the lord will come like a thief on that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise the elements will burn and be dissolved and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed verse 11 says since all these things are to be dissolved in this way that is through the fire it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness verse 12 also says as you wait for the day of god and hasten its coming because of that day the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat so their argument is if the earth is going to be burned up why bother uh well my counter counter argument there is that the way to peter the apostle peter mentions about the earth being burned up is not necessarily pointing to the fact that the earth will be no more or creation will be no more you know right the nature will be no more i think it is more pointing to the fact that the earth and heaven will remain but the the point about the fire dissolving it is only a metaphor for purifying it or cleaning it up cleansing it right so it is not necessarily that the earth will cease to exist and that is how i would like to look at it now if they say well since the earth is going to be burned up why bother well then you can also say that your body will eventually rot right uh, why bother why look after the body right and uh, we do have a scripture that talk about glorifying god, god in our body and so uh, once again in my view that argument doesn't seem to hold as uh, as strongly as they'd like to put it forward look at the third point with regards to creation care and the people who oppose it they say that uh, we are to save people not the environment okay and you remember the great commission that jesus gave go and preach the gospel all right uh, and make disciples of people um so the great commission is basically to save people and not the environment now how can you argue against that <laughs> well in my view uh the great commission does talk about going and preaching the gospel to people making them disciples and of course bringing them into relationship with christ but it is it does not necessarily uh, follow that we are to neglect the environment it doesn't necessarily you know uh, you know logically uh, we can uh, we can uh, we cannot logically assume that creation care is wrong and that we only have to save people so in other words arguing from an absence of what is mentioned mentioned or not mentioned there is i don't think uh, a valid theological perspective uh, there is there is no mention of the environment just because there is no mention of the environment doesn't mean to say that environment care is wrong okay so that's how i would argue uh, with regards to that and finally one more point i'd like to point out and that is you remember in genesis chapter 1 and verse 28 it talks about uh human beings created of course in the image of god and then the command to go and subdue the earth rule the fish and uh, you know the birds and all the animals right or some translations say go and dominate right the earth uh uh so the argument here is well you're supposed to uh, subdue the earth rule over the earth you're not supposed to necessarily want to worry about its care right now uh i have a counterpoint here again and that is 
uh, I think the words used there, the the words to uh, that mention subdue or rule, doesn't necessarily mean that you should exploit it, or you should plunder it, or you should destroy it. I think it is more in the sense of being stewards. We are told to be stewards of the creation. We are not told to to dominate it in such a manner where we plunder and completely exploit it to destroy it. Uh, a steward is one who looks after what is given to him. And I would like to believe that God would have given the earth to us, uh, not so that we can exploit it to its complete extinction, but to provide some sense of care. So that is how uh, these people argue, and that is how I would like to look at it. Let's move to the next point. Uh, what about those who say, yes, creation care is biblical, and they do have some scriptures to use to say that creation care is biblical. Uh, the, one, the, the first point uh, they would use is, remember, God declared the creation to be good. He said all that he created was good. And of course, when human beings were created, he qualified the good with a very, right? It is very good, he said. So when, the, when God declares creation to be good, so there is nothing inherently bad in it, uh, where we sort of go to the extent of neglecting it or discarding it or spoiling it. So creation being declared as good uh, is an indication that something good needs to be preserved. And God would expect for human beings as stewards of the creation to certainly use it, but not abuse it. So that is how uh, these people would argue that you can certainly be stewards in using it judiciously, correctly, properly, not necessarily to abuse it. Uh, uh, another point that people that uh, believe in creation care say is uh, Genesis 2 and verse 15. You remember what uh, uh, God told Adam once he uh, placed him in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in Genesis 2 verse 15, maybe I'll just read that verse for you. I'll read it from the uh, NIV version. Where it says, the Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it, right? To work it and watch over it. Uh, some other creations say to dress it and keep it, right? Uh, this, I think I'm, uh, what is quoted on your screen is from the NLT version, the New Living Translation says, to work it and take care of it. So, the Garden of Eden uh, was given to Adam, not to abuse it, but to definitely enjoy its presence and being in its presence, but also to look after it, to dress it and to keep it. Obviously, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, inherent in that command is care, creation care. Uh, it is meant to give us pleasure, certainly, and it is meant to give us life because it gives us food to eat. And you know that God told them that they can eat from uh, all of it except one. So obviously inherent in this command is uh, uh, not to destroy the, the garden, but to preserve it, to take care of it. Let's look at two more thoughts. The next one is about the Sabbath rest. Most of you will remember, and most, most of us will remember, having come from our tradition of Sabbath keeping. You know, there is a Sabbath rest for the land. And it's very interesting how it is uh, mentioned in the book of uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 25. Uh, once again, I'll just read it for you. Leviticus 25 and reading in verse 3 where it says, you may sow your field for six years and you may prune your vineyard and gather its produce for six years. Verse four, but there will be a Sabbath of complete rest for the land in the seventh year, a Sabbath to the Lord. 
uh, you are not to sow or your field or prune your vineyard. Okay. And verse 5 also says, you are not to reap what grows by itself from your crop or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. It is to be a year of complete rest for the land. All right. So here is a command that uh, is uh, telling the Israelites to keep the land, uh, or to give it rest in the seventh year and don't use any produce. In fact, I think another command says, let the those who are landless come and take and eat from it. That is that what naturally grows. They're not to, uh, to actually uh, till the land. Let me also read Exodus chapter 23 and verse 10. Uh, it says, uh, Exodus 23 verse 10, sow your land for six years and gather its produce. But during the seventh year, you are to let it rest and leave it uncultivated so that the poor among you, your people may eat from it. Notice this is where it mentions that. The poor among you, you may eat from it and the wild animals may consume what they leave. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive groves. So what does the Sabbath rest with regards to creation care mean? I believe that uh, it indicates that God's, God has concern for the land. He doesn't want us to till it in such a manner where we completely destroy it of its nutrients and uh, make it unproductive for the rest of the years. Uh, so he wants that we give it rest so that it continues to be productive. In other words, it's a command against exploitation. And of course, it's also a command to help the poor, you know, in the seventh year. So that is... Uh, uh, very clearly ind indicative of the fact that creation care is something that is uh, not frowned upon or not against the Bible. Let's look at one more thought. The story of Noah, uh, the ark and the flood. All right. Now, uh, there is something interesting here. And I was, uh, I was uh, listening to a lecture given by uh, Reverend Rowan Williams, you must have heard that name. Rowan Williams is the former Archbishop of Canterbury. And he has something very interesting to say about it. But let me first read Genesis chapter 6 for you. Uh, and just pick up what exactly is mentioned there. Genesis chapter 6, reading in verse 19. It says, this is now talk, God talking to Noah, telling him having to prepare the ark. And once the ark is prepared, he says in verse 19, you're also to bring into the ark two of all the living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Verse 20, two of everything from the birds according to their kinds, from the livestock according to their kinds, and from the animals that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And he says, will come to you so that you can keep them alive. Now, I was talking to you about Rowan Williams, and he has some, an interesting take on this. He says, saving humanity, now the, the flood was to save, you know, I mean to say, of course, destroy uh, all of humanity except Noah's family. But uh, Reverend Williams says, saving humanity is tied up with saving all living things, right? And uh, saving living things in such a manner where you have to bring breeding pairs, right? Bring them male and female in pairs. For what reason? So that they can multiply and save an ecosystem, right? To save an ecosystem. Does it probably give us some idea that God was interested to save the ecosystem? He is interested in the environment, even as he wiped out the rest of humanity except Noah's family, uh, he was interested in saving an ecosystem. So perhaps uh, an argument for creation care. An inter another interesting uh, comment that uh, Reverend Williams makes is, he says, today's environmental crisis points to a culture and a, uh, a cultural and a spiritual crisis. Right? 
and what is that? He says the cultural and, and environmental or rather the cultural spiritual crisis that points to the environmental crisis is the lack of respect for life. Right? There seem to be a lack of respect for life. And I think that's a very telling statement. And we can see that, you know, uh, very much in our world, a lack of respect for life. Even human life is not respect. You know, leave alone animal life and, of course, the environmental life. Rowan Williams also mentions that, you know, God commanded Adam to care for the animals in the way he asked them, asked him to name them. And he says that it parallels God's uh, care for us, the way he asked Adam to care for the animals. Okay, so this is how we would look at uh, the biblical perspective. Some, of course, believe no, and they have a reason for it. Uh, some say yes, and there is a good reason for it. Uh, I tend to lean towards uh, the creation care that it is biblical. Now, what I want to do is, now that, you know, we so very much talk about our Trinitarian theology. I'd like to bring you a, what I call is an incarnational Trinitarian perspective to creation care. So, uh, you know, follow me as I go along. I want to bring you two points here. And I'd like to show you that uh, creation care is something that uh, God values, uh, and I would think it is something that he wants us to be conscious of. God wants us to be conscious of our environment and obviously conscious in a way where we obviously provide care and look after them. All right, I have these two points which I'd like to bring. Look at the first one. We all believe this is the incarnational perspective. Jesus took on flesh. We know that he entered the created environmental realm, right? And uh, what does that prove? That matter and spirit are not, they are not antithetical, which is the heresy of the Gnos Gnostics, the Gnosticism, you know, heresy, or, the, or also called the Docetism, right? Now, what am I trying to uh, basically prove here from the incarnational perspective? What I'm saying is, you know, the, the Greek word for gnosis, this is from the Gnostics, is knowledge. Uh, and the Gnostics believed <clears throat> there was a mysterious or a secret knowledge reserved for those with true understanding, right? You have to have that secret knowledge, which will, if you attain it, lead to salvation of the soul, right? Or the human spirit. So they believed in the salvation of the soul or the spirit, which meant that anything that is material, anything that is natural is evil, which is not good. So their perspective was material matter, uh, you know, body, is all evil and you need to be saved from it, right? Now, the, the question is, did Jesus take on flesh? Now, they have an answer for that. They say that Jesus only seemed to have a physical body. He did not have a real physical body, right? Why? Because flesh is evil. Flesh is bad. Flesh is wicked. And Jesus could never have taken on something or, uh, you know, merged himself with something that is evil. But this is the denial of the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, where we believe that God, Jesus, was fully God and also fully man, fully human. So what does the incarnational perspective, you know, teach us or provide for us? My thought here is that matter is not inherently evil. Obviously, that is, the, that, that is why Jesus took on flesh and he redeemed it. He redeemed us, you know, uh, 
you know, in the, in the flesh. So if matter is not antithetical to the spirit, we must not think of the environment also in those terms, that as though the environment is something inferior, that is something bad and, and inherently evil. So from an incarnational perspective, I would believe that God does not regard matter as something evil. He created it in the first place, even though, of course, it got polluted through sinfulness. Uh, and, and he is in the process of redeeming it. Jesus coming in the flesh is to redeem uh, you know, us uh, in our body. So, uh, so the in, incarnational perspective does not lend itself to an environment or thinking of the environment as evil. Let's look at the second point, and that is the Trinitarian perspective. The second point reads, the mystery of the Trinity points to the reality of interrelatedness. Now, I, uh, I, I'll explain you know, why I use the word mystery. All right. Um, so it, it points to the reality of interrelatedness. In other words, relational diversity within a unity. Right. That is the the fundamental reality that we uh, believe through the Trinitarian perspective. All right. Uh, so let me come back to it. I mentioned that the mystery of the Trinity. Now, why do I say mystery? Obviously, I'd like to mention it that that, you know, the, 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 the for, to fully explain the Trinity is beyond logic. Uh, it's not against logic. Uh, it is not illogical but it is beyond our human logic. We are unable to fully uh, explain or comprehend the one God in Father, Son, Spirit, All right? So there is a mis mysti mystical aspect to it. But the fact that there is Father and Son and then there is Spirit explains the existence of diversity within a unity, right? I think, I hope you're with me as I'm going along. Now, what I want to mention is that the environment that God created, the universe that God created, uh, manifests that uh, diversity, right? Right from the sub-atomic uh, sub particle, to the largest galaxies, I believe that there is an interrelatedness, right? Um, so what does this prove? This proves that diversity and unity is a fundamental reality. And humans, if you look at the last uh, part of the sentence, the humans are created in that community. In other words, humans are not independent. Uh, the environment is our larger, our larger context. We thrive within this context, right? If we, if we decide to be independent of that context of the larger diversity, we wither away, we recede. We, you know, if we cannot live outside of that, that context, and that is what I want to prove from the Trinitarian perspective, right? I'd like to read from the book of Romans chapter eight, just to bring this thought a little bit more, uh, give it a, a bit more clarity. In the book of Romans, the apostle here um, mentions, I'm going to Romans chapter eight and verse, I'll begin in verse 20. Okay, uh, notice what it says here, talking about God view of the universe, of the environment. It says in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. Interesting words used there, right? 
the creation is going to be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. God's children are within the context of the creation. And the creation is being set free and redeemed from decay. So the redemption of humanity is within the context of the entire creation of God. Right? Verse 22 also says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit at the first fruits. Okay, I'll leave that. So, yes, the whole creation is groaning, but God is going to redeem it. And we are created within a context of a larger creation, and that is the universe, which is going to, in one sense, be redeemed. And, you know, and the prophecies in the, by the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they talk about deserts, deserts blooming. Or deserts will rejoice with flowers. Dry land will be filled with springs. Now, I, I, I know there is a metaphorical thought to it. I realize that uh, it has a, it is a, a, a very important message metaphorically. But maybe God is also trying to show us that he's restoring a, to use a Hebrew word, shalom, right? He's restoring a shalom, which means peace all around, wholeness, completeness. And it isn't it Jesus who said that I have come to give you life and life in all its fullness. All right. So I believe that a, the Trinitarian reality points to this diversity within a unity where humans are created within the larger context of uh, the universe and the entire universe is being redeemed. And that's how I would like to look at it. In other words, creation care is something that God uh, is not against. He, it is close to his heart. He, he wants for us to be aware of the fact that creation care is important. Okay, so let's uh, wrap it up now. Let's look at some, let's reflect on what we discussed so far. I think what we discussed so far basically tells us the first point, don't be indifferent. We cannot be indifferent to the destruction of the environment. We cannot take an indifferent view to uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the world uh, around us, uh, nature around us. I think there is a need for us to be, uh, to have a sense of care for the environment around us. Uh, I think Christians, if you bring a Christian perspective, the second point says participate in making a difference. Christians need to participate in making a difference to the environment. We must be what Adam was told to be in Eden, that the Garden of Eden, that we must dress and keep it. We must look after it. We must take care of the environment. So we must participate in a manner where we make a difference to the environment. Now, I am not suggesting that you go and become an activist and hug trees or, uh, you know, uh, fight the, fight the whaling industry. Uh, if, if you can do that, well and good, but I'm not uh, advocating that. But I think we must do everything to make a difference to the environment, remembering what Adam was told uh, to do in the Garden of Eden. And, and, and last of all, you know, in one sense, uh, it is looking after the environment is loving the next generation, isn't it? And that is something that uh, we have been told by the activists that what kind of a world are you leaving for the next generation? Are you leaving a scorched earth? Are you leaving an earth that is depleted of oxygen? Uh, that would be so unfortunate. Let me read you a scripture in uh, Proverbs chapter 13, talking about next generation. I believe uh, it's a biblical mandate for us to remember the next generation. In book of Proverbs chapter 13, there's an interesting thought I'd like to leave you with. Verse uh, 22 in Proverbs uh, 13, right? This is what it says. A good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth is stored up for the for the righteous. Okay, but notice that first part. 
a good man, or it says a prudent man in some translation, leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. It's not just only to the next generation, but to the next to the next generation. So the Bible talks about prudence being providing for and looking after the environment so that the gener so the in, uh, you know the next generation can enjoy it. Right. So I think. Uh, from a biblical perspective, if you look at the, the Christian response to the environmental crisis, we Christians certainly should not subscribe to an indiscriminate dis uh, destruction of the earth. Like I said, we must learn to remember what God told Adam to dress and keep it. So to that extent, maybe some of us should become green Christians. Right? Uh, we must adopt a green attitude. Uh, you know, so that we have some kind of a participation in restoration and redemption of the environment. Finally, I'd like to leave you with this verse from the book of Psalm chapter 24. Uh, Psalm 24 and verse 1 says, uh, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. I, I, I quote that verse only to say that the earth, all of creation belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to us. We are nothing more but stewards who have been placed on the earth, enjoy it, but to look after it, right? And I believe that creation care makes good sense. Uh, and the Christian response should be that we should be, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, adhering to the philosophy of looking after the earth and not destroying it. Okay, so let me stop there then. Uh, uh, before, um, before we open up for discussion, I'd like to read you from the, I don't know if Praveen has this on his screen, but I'd like to read you what... The booklet has mentioned about creation care. This is question 15 on page 56. Uh, the question reads, why should Christians not abuse the natural environment? All right, and uh, I'll go ahead and read it for you. God commands that we care for the earth in ways that reflect his loving care for all of his creation. We are responsible for ensuring that the earth's gifts are used fairly and wisely, that no creature suffers from the abuse of what we are given, and that future generations may continue to enjoy the abundance and goodness of the earth in praise to God. Failure to be good stewards of the natural environment dishonors God and disrupts the fruitful harmony of human beings with their environment. I'll stop with that. Open. It's open now for your comments. Okay, Anil, go ahead. <laughs> you mentioned that the Franciscans uh, consider animals brothers and sisters and all that. So are they vegetarians or what? They don't kill. <laughs> uh, I can't say for a fact, but I think they are. I think they are vegetarians and they will not harm anim animals. Uh, but they have, I think... Um, uh, St. Francis, uh, who was it? Uh, St. Francis, right? Who was started the Franciscan's order. Uh, yeah. But he was one of those, I'm not sure, I, I, I failed to, I didn't check it out. <laughs> but he was very close to, you know, nature. He loved nature and uh, and he used to address animals as brothers and sisters. So uh, I'm presuming they are vegetarian or vegans. <laughs> I think... Uh, uh... The, the perspective you presented, the pros and cons and biblical and so on, that's fine. But I think even from a commonsensical uh, uh, view, it, I mean, you have to take care of whatever is given to you. 
So you can't just say that, look, this will all go away, why bother and so on. Anything, anything that you neglect and don't care of will finally, you know, decay. Your home, your car, your body, or anything for that matter. So it's commonsensical to take care of the environment, take care of nature. That's my view. I think you're very right, Anil, uh, that uh, uh, common sense, I think now is dawning upon lots of people. Uh, and, uh, and the way, and the way uh, we have been abusing the environment is shocking. I don't know if you have watched a, uh, a, a documentary on Netflix. I forget the name of it, something to do with the sea and how fishing, overfishing is literally destroying the oceans. And there is something called dragnet fishing. You've probably heard of this dragnet fishing where they not only, you know, catch uh, just too much of fish, but they also destroy the coral reefs because they drag this net, which completely uh, removes the coral cover on the ocean floor. And I'm told that the, or, or the or coral cover actually absorbs CO2 and was meant to stabilize the, you know, the uh, atmosphere for us. But when you're destroying the, uh, you know, ocean bed like that, and of course, overfishing, where we are losing species, oh, that is, I mean, like you said, doesn't stand to common sense. Right. Right. <laughs> Look what they're doing to the Amazon forests. I mean, they're disappearing at a faster rate, you know, and they're supposed to be the lungs of the earth and they are just ruining it because absolutely. development pressures. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the destruction of uh, green cover uh, is, I think, causing the extreme weather perhaps uh, and flooding and all of that. And that's so very unfortunate. Any thoughts to uh, where we talked about the redemption? I mean, God's redeeming or, you know, of uh, the whole creation. Uh, and the fact that we are going to be embodied spiritual beings. <laughs> we are not going to be, you know, Casper the friendly ghost. <laughs> we are going to be embodied human beings perhaps is indicative of the fact that there is something about the, you know, the environment that God is going to preserve. I'm not, you know, obviously we are not given privy to what really will happen in the future. But any thoughts on that? Praveen, you have any thoughts to share on that? Of course, uh, we might all remember, we used to talk about the world tomorrow. And yes. we used to say how wonderful the world tomorrow will be. And, uh, Right. You know, uh, it, it, it really inspired us with a beautiful picture of uh, abundance and, uh, you know, total uh, fruitfulness and life. And, of course, Jesus talks about the abundant life, which is, of course, uh, which is yet for us to fully experience. I think there is no human who doesn't like nature. Everyone, it's inherent in us. From the Garden of Eden right up to the, in the future, it'll always be inherent. And therefore, I think uh, it's common sense to maintain it. Absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, when you, and when you talk about that, you know, the, uh, the, once again, the common sense to maintain it. Um, notice what has happened, you know, in some countries where they are eating uh, all kinds of uh, animals, that were never meant to be eaten. And uh, of course, the whole pandemic today is also oh, oh, probably one of the reasons why, you know, bringing all these animals and then uh, consuming, consuming it and maybe, you know, and all of this is all an abuse of nature, I would believe. Right. When you talk about, uh, you know, all of, all of us as human beings love nature, uh, you must see Mrs. Noah's garden and she's got some lovely fruit trees 
she shares it with us sometimes mrs noah what's growing in your garden today <laughs> <laughs> right uh yeah i just wanted to mention that mrs noah is joining us and uh, she loves uh, gardening and uh, i i remember she and mrs phillips used to go and try to every time we go for a feast they used to go and pinch plants and uh, <laughs> and various thing to grow in their garden so uh, they are they have green fingers wonderful <laughs> great stuff well i guess uh, if there are no more comments um we have one more question in the section that we have been going through over the past few weeks and uh, that question is and of course the the, the section is about uh, the christian life and uh, we dealt with the environment today and the one more question which i wanted to deal with is what is the christian view of marriage now <laughs> this to some extent has become controversial because of uh, extreme liberal views with regards to marriage and some people don't even believe in marriage uh and i think uh, i think we need to give it a give it a study uh and so maybe i will present my thoughts uh next time and so maybe you can be thinking of it and uh, let's look at what the bible has to say about marriage and uh, what it pictures and of course the current view of it and some of the extreme views which uh, uh which is not very easy to you know to digest but nevertheless uh, i think it's worth giving giving it a fair hearing all right okay thank you again for joining us if you have no other comments or any other thoughts you'd like to share uh, we have a whole lot of people whose faces we can't see but i hope that you're all uh, uh, okay and you've been listening uh and i was just wondering if om prakash can hear me om prakash <laughs> uh, what happened can he unmute, unmute himself praveen um, uh, oh, yes sir i can hear you okay all right i was just thinking would it be okay if i ask you to do close in prayer we love to we love to hear you pray for us uh sure sir yes if you want to you can do it in hindi also no problem heavenly father thank you very much for uh, this wonderful message and uh, helping us to understand that uh, the the creation this wonderful creation which uh, uh, where uh, you put uh, adam and eve to take care of us it uh, we own the same responsibility Uh, towards uh, the environment creation father and uh, thank you very much father for helping to understand that uh, misusing it and uh, po- uh, not treating it uh, well uh, is one of the causes uh, uh, of uh, pre- present day problems uh, father thank you very much for these messages and uh, the current messages uh, which are really helpful to us and uh, uh, we pray you to continue blessing our church especially father where you have put us and uh, uh, we ask your intervention that uh, this uh, present uh, uh, difficulty in our church be resolved in jesus name we pray amen